go. Straight out the shower. All right, y'all. What's up? Today we're covering Ernest Hemingway. We're doing a double feature today. We're, we've got Ernest Hemingway's A Farewell to Arms and In Our Time, two of the um, early Hemingway works and the most important. And these are two of his works from the 1920s. Um, in Our Time came first, and then A Farewell to Arms came at the end of the 20s, about 1929. So we're, we're not covering Sun Also Rises because that deserves a whole completely different stream. But I hope everybody's doing well today because I, I thought we would cover this because it's pretty interesting. No, <laughs> I thought we would cover this these two works because they go hand in hand. Um, in Our Time is really a series of vignettes and short stories that are brought together with a number of prose poems, um, italicized prose poems that sort of take us back in time um, and to different locations. And some of the works, uh, some of the words and the passages in In Our Time are repeated and changed a bit in Farewell to Arms. Okay, so, so what we're going to do is we're going to talk about Ernest Hemingway, who is Hemingway? Who is Papa Hemingway, as they call him? Why is he important? Um, why is he relevant? What are the works about? We're going to dive into the form and content of the two works. Discuss the significance of Hemingway's prose. I'm going to give you some of my own uh, personal thoughts about Hemingway and how they've changed, I, I guess, fairly drastically over a number of years and they just recently changed again i mean rereading farewell to arms really kind of changed my opinion again about hemingway because i think and i think that's good i think it's good to you know when you read an author especially when you reread a, a great writer to have um the kind of i don't know like relationship with the writing where you have a personal you know personal feelings about it and a, and a personal connection that's not to say that this is uh, going to be all about feelings, of course, because that would that would sort of nullify the 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 analysis of Hemingway's writing himself. And we're I'm going to kind of dispel some of the things that we know or that we think we know about about Ernest Hemingway and what he represents and his his literature and about his the kind of I don't know popular appeal about him um, because I think it's a he's a complex writer. And he deserves, um, his writing deserves to be looked at in terms of at least, you know, our small little corner here, um, our our small corner on the internet. So I thought I would dive into him also because we've covered, again, we've covered a, a, a wide range. We've covered, you know, like 104, we've done 114 here in less than a year on um, all sorts of literature throughout the canon. And so there comes a time when you have to, we've done a number of modern works. There comes a time when you have to cover someone like Hemingway because he's important in terms of in terms of the western canon and so it's important to you know it's just it's sort of integral to understanding not only modernity and modernism but why writing is the way that it is now remember that the novel itself was is a is a fairly new invention in terms of a a, a medium in literature because for most of literature we have epic poems and then we and then we have lyric poems we have narrative versus lyric poems and then it's not until really the 1700s when we get the first novels we get henry fielding and then daniel defoe we've covered jam could say as foe um which is a take on daniel on daniel defoe's robinson crusoe um and then of course people like charles dickens really made the the novel popular because it's easy to read that fits into the the Dickens is important because he fits into the way that the the Anglo world proliferates in terms of colonization in the 19th century. So there are so these people are everywhere and thus goes their culture. And then that the writing then starts to affect the way that people live their lives. And Dickens, of course, was published in serialized form and they tried to publish Hemingway in serialized form, but he was kind of against it. The novel works as a whole. Now, I'm also going to look at some analysis. And um, Harold Bloom, of course, can't you know can't go through this without talking about Harold Bloom because Harold Bloom has um, some of the most significant takes, especially on American literature. And he says that Hemingway is always comparing himself to Huck Finn 
um, his work to Huck Finn, you know, himself, not really himself to Mark Twain, but his work is compared, you know, he compares it, his own work to Huck Finn, at least in spirit. Um, and what that means is basically that Huck Finn is the great American novel. Huck Finn, Moby Dick, we've covered uh, Moby Dick, Scarlet Letter, and the sort of mid 19th century American works that really put American literature on the map. You know, again, starting with Washington Irving and short stories, but then going into the 19th century, uh, mid 19th century with novels. And then Hemingway sort of inherits that spirit. But his work is actually closer to the pro, the, the sort of not prose poems, but the long epic verse of Walt Whitman, um, if anything. Um, it's Harold Bloom actually compares him his his work closer to like Rudyard Kipling's Kim um, than anything else, ra especially rather than Huck Finn, and that's because of the content and what he's what he's focusing on. But we're going to see with Farewell to Arms that the novel is so revol re I say revolutionary, it, it, revolutionary in terms of its writing style. And now it's hard to understand this in a sense if you don't know literature well, because now. Hemingway's writing is so ingrained in the way that we think about the novel itself or about any sort of writing activity that it's it's it can be easy to forget that what he did was um, totally changed the way that the novel was written and the way that it's presented in terms of even just looking at the form, the you know, the form on the page. Again, Harold Bloom sort of compares his prose. He says Hemingway is essentially more of a poet. I you know, I sort of take exception to that, but I understand what he's saying. Um, and I think it's a valid opinion in terms of the importance of the, the, the way that Hemingway constructs his novels is much more like, I guess the analogy would be like, you imagine a sculptor, this fits well because Ezra Pound and Gaudier Breshka um, and the modern, the modern beginnings of the modern era the point was to revolutionize writing so that it wasn't just, you know, the law descriptions of everything that run on in the page. And that was fine for, for when it happened, you know, we get, we get dicks, um, where we have pages and pages of descriptions. We've gone through Hawthorne. We've gone through Emerson, Emerson, we've gone through Poe and those are all great. Um, but what Hemingway does is he sort of takes the block of marble that is the English language and then, and and writes his novel and then chisels it away so that we only have the best words in the best order, as Coleridge said. So I think that that's that's interesting. Now, now Hemingway is also accessible. Um, the reason he's so great is because he's also accessible to the average reader. He's a, you know, he's at the same time as he's a, you know, a craftsman and a wordsmith. He's also a um, he's also a, an adventure writer. He writes about manly things. He writes about war. And like I've said from the very beginning, like, I think it's important to draw a clear distinction between the life of the writer and his autobiography and the way that the characters appear in the works, because once the writer puts the pen to the page, um, they are creating a character and, and Obviously, they're going to use their own lives to inform what they do. But Hemingway's work is autobiographical, and it's it's not really important to we could know nothing about Hemingway and the work still stands, is what I'm trying to say. Um, just like with with Shakespeare or any great writer. It's the work on the page that matters. It's not the, you know, discussion about it. If even it's interesting that I say that, that I use the term life because like Henry Lucy and Life magazine, they're all about like sort of creating this mythology of Hemingway. And that's cool. I mean, that's 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 fine in terms of like if you're interested. But when you're trying to go deeper and do a kind of a deep analysis or explication of the work, it's important to draw a distinction between that and to understand that the symbolism um, in the book, or or rather the worldview that he's espousing in in each work, is something that is relevant now and that captures the human condition. And so one thing that one reason that I have a, a a problem with Hemingway is that I find his I guess this is kind of surface level but I find his sort of nihilistic spirit I guess it's kind of ironic to use the term spirit in that sense but his sort of his his esprit de nihilism in his works off-putting um of course because 
but 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 like I said from the beginning, um, all works of art, especially literature, are really about two things. This is my opinion. Um, so people can disagree, but but they are about two things. One is um, our relationship. The most important is our relationship with God. Meaning, like, who are we? Why are, why are we here? What are we doing? And that comes out in in all works. And then the second is our relationship with each other. How are we supposed to get along, right? And 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 by not get along, that's in reference to getting along. And so, farewell to arms is about the Great War and this character's time as an ambulance driver in the Italian army. He's an American, but he's in the Italian army. And I suppose if I, if I have a thesis for this and for Hemingway's work, um, it would, in general, it would be that his work is really about um, love and the lack of love. And he, and the way that, that war brings out this distinction, it, it sort of synthesizes all events. It's like, um, was it Hort was it Hotler that said that war is the crucible of all human um interactions? I'm paraphrasing. But that is kind of what happens um with Hemingway because with, with Hemingway's works, because we see in this um in a farewell to arms, the character is specifically in the war. It's a wartime setting. Um the sun also rises is slightly different because it's it's there's a lot of post-war activity, but everything is in reference to the war and the way that he sees human events and human interaction synthesized in that. And, and the character is, doesn't, the characters are, 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 they are stoic. And, and he writes in a, if Hemingway is anything, he is terse. And he uses ellipsis to the maximum degree. So it's really like what is not on, what is not on the page rather than what's on the page. And, and what is clearly not there and what he's not saying is, is like love, okay? And what I mean by that is that there's a scene in A Farewell to Arms, which I'm going to get to, where he's talking to a priest and the priest says to him, um, you know, aren't you worried? And he's like, he's basically like, mm, what am I, you know, I'm not worried about it. He doesn't say I'm not worried about anything. He just says no <laughs> in typical, typical Hemingway style. Um, and then the guy says, um, do, he asks him, do you love God? And um, he, he basically says, uh, I don't know what love is. I don't love anyone. And um, which is, come on, dude, right? Um, I, I, I can, you can see when you're reading it, not his reasons for saying that. And you don't approve. You obviously, we, that, I find that repugnant. But I, I understand the character in light of the events and, and, the, and his, his, what he's saying um and that makes the that makes me uh sort of that's what pisses me off just in plain speak that's what pisses me off about hemingway is that i find his that he he try he finds depth in the present moment and i get that but his lack of understanding of like when the kid when the priest says to him um what about your soul and he says i don't know what a soul is it's like come on dude i get it like you're in the war and you know all this stuff is happening and you know you, you're the fact that you're not even talking about it means that it's all it's all up inside and i get that there's a point where we go beyond like the idea of stoicism and man and the kind of manliness that people see on this on the surface and you go, this guy is, is, is he an idiot? Is he a, is, is he just a nihilist? Is this just existentialism um, in extremists? What is this? So those are the kind of problems that I have with Hemingway and the questions that people can feel free to, you know, discuss that, especially if you're reading, if you're watching this later and you have commentary about what you think about that, you know, put it in the, put it in the comments afterwards. Um, and uh, give me some perspective, some context. But, you know, what I mean is that I've read a lot of Hemingway. Um, and I think, I think it's important to read writers that we, um, don't, we don't particularly like sometimes because, number one, the, your opinion might change. There might be some depth or some new angle that we don't understand, but also because it provides context for why these people are significant. So, so what I found with this book was that after all that, I found the book to be beautiful. It is a beautiful book because, because there are visceral passages in this where 
Hemingway does this thing. It's like it's his iceberg theory of prose, where what he does is he provides, um, he he shows us the images, and everything is sensory, um, and and there's empirical data in points, and we when he goes through situations, we understand exactly like like there's a part in our time where um, he and his friend are skiing in the Alps, and then they come to this. Um, like a like a cabin basically like a, not a it, it's just like a little ski lodge right and and it describes how like they ski up to it they they unlatch their skis they're in their ski boots they knock off the snow from their boots they kind of shake off and then they walk inside and the way that he describes it is so mundane but it is so perfect because that's exactly what you would do and i and i appreciate that but the iceberg theory thing is like once he, it's like a slow melt and it's moving. And once you get to the, the, the chunk, right. Which in terms of the iceberg also is, is an interesting image. Cause we've talked about like the iceberg is you, what you see on the surface above the surface of the water is the text. That's the words on the page. Then beneath the water, beneath the waterline is the bulk of the iceberg, right? It's floating down there. Um, submarine. And, that's the subtext. That's reading between the lines. That's the figurative language. That's the meaning. That's illusion and allegory and, and all the all the important things that we apply to our own lives and to our worldview. And once you get to those parts in the book, they are stark. I mean, they really, they really hit you. And it it's interesting because it's not like when we did Glamorama and we read, you know, 200 pages of just names and products and fashion lines and stuff. And then we finally get to the meat of the novel or like an American psycho. And then we're like torn away for, or into the story because of the violence. That's not what occurs, but in a sense, you can see how postmodernism takes Ernest Hemingway's modernism and kind of moves it to its natural progression, right. In the, in the broken landscape. And, and, and another thing is that, Hemingway is all about the broken, fragmented, burned landscape. And we can tell that that's, he makes references to this in his work because it is the uh, scarred up landscape of the Great War. Okay, so before I get to a general description of what the two books are about and then dive into the words, a um, couple of interesting things about Hemingway's life. So, so again, I'm going to give kind of a biography because I think people find this interesting. And again, it's not necessary, but it is it is interesting and maybe provide some context. Um, so Hemingway was born in 1899. He's kind of a uh, generation of 99. Fan de Sacre. He's the he's the um, end. He's two years. You know, he's born two years um, before the end of the Victorian era. Of course, he's born in Oak Park, Illinois. And. He, as a child, you know, he was taken out by his his parents. They would spend a lot of time uh, uh, up in the Upper Peninsula. The Youpers, shouts out to based homeschool mom and Andy, because he was up up in the uh, he was a kind of a Youper, um, and he would spend a lot of time in nature. That's kind of what the Nick Adams stories are about, especially in, in our time. But he, um, you know, he was an athlete and he played football and he boxed and all this stuff and. Of course, he also wrote for he got a job working for a um, for a newspaper as a sports reporter. And this is interesting because the way that the newspaper journalism kind of apprenticeship that he went through affected him really affected the way that he wrote in a in a good way, in a positive way. He learned to write um simple sentences and write things as they are. And that fits his descriptions and his worldview and his, in his books. Um, and any writer could, could do with understanding that it's kind of like, you know, when you're first, when you're, when you're like starting to write advanced levels in, let's say middle school. And, um, and then you, you, you learn this term run on sentence and the, the term run on sentence is so annoying to me because it, it's a misnomer in a way. There is a thing called a run-on sentence. It's not a general description of any long sentence. And even adults kind of have trouble understanding that. A compound complex sentence is not a run-on sentence. A run-on sentence is a sentence that runs off from the subject, right? The, and, and usually that's because of um, the prevalence of too many adjectives and adverbs, and you're not sticking with the two things that are important 
in language, especially in writing, which are the noun and the verb. The noun and the verb are the key to it, the English language. The noun is the person, place, thing, or idea. And it exists, um, it exists kind of like, like planets, okay? Like if you think of, you know, the image of like the, the, the solar system and we have these planets and they are prevalent. You, go, you have a sentence and if you go four words without a noun, it's like there's something wrong. There's a noun there. And then the verb is the action in the sentence. It's the action, emotion, or state of being. It's the engine. It's the thing that drives. It's like Dylan Thomas said, the force that through the dream, green fuse drives the flower. So all the planets are revolving around the verb. But the verb is the most important part of speech because it's, it is, it's the engine. It's the motion. It's the muscle in the sentence. Okay. And one thing Hemingway does is he writes so many adverbs, and we know that he's doing that purposefully. He's a great craftsman in terms of language, but but when he says something is very nice, I've, I've mentioned before how I hate I, I hate very because if something is nice, it's already very nice. If something's beautiful, it's already very beautiful. The word beautiful has the inherent beauty within the word, so we don't need a very. But Hemingway does it purposefully because it's ellipsis. He's trying to describe things in a simple way with in a in a in the present tense without there being a past or a future. And we and we I get that. It's something I don't like, but I understand what he's doing in his language. I wouldn't, you know, I'm not saying I I would that it should be changed because it exists as it is in time um in in his words. Um so he learned, he learned from being a newspaper, a sports reporter, how to write. And then he went off um, uh, to World War I, and he spent, a, a, you know, it was a short period um, as an ambulance driver. But that's what A Farewell to Arms is about. And, and I'm going to get into what, that, what really the book is about and what happens in the book after this. But um, he uh, then went to Paris, and he uh, happened to, like, go to this nexus point where all of these great artists were living. And this is, you can see this happening in the sense that the war happens and we have all these people in Europe and it's after the war. And then they gravitate to, to Paris and they all happen to meet each other because they're all expatriates. Right. Um, and, and the key group is like Gertrude Stein. Gertrude Stein is the one who, she also helped Hemingway without a right. She said, a rose is a rose is a rose. Meaning you don't have to describe the rose in terms of what it, you know, it's, d d d have a description about it. You can just have the image itself as a rose. Um, Gertrude Stein, John Dos Passos, uh, Ford Maddox Ford, um, James Joyce, of course, T.S. Eliot, Ezra Pound, uh, William Carlos Williams was there for a time. and um, And so, a couple of interesting things that happened out of that. Really, my favorite Hemingway book, if if you like ever had to read one Hemingway book, the books that you probably read when you were younger, like The Old Man in the Sea. I mean, you know, they gave I've read the I've read The Old Man in the Sea probably, I don't know, 49 times. Okay. And not because it's my favorite book. Um, in fact, it's it's whatever, but but um that's the book that he was essentially nominated for the Nobel Prize for Literature for, and then won. Um, and he's a pretty young man in terms of, he wasn't as young as Rudyard Kipling winning the Nobel Prize. Um, Rudyard Kipling was the, Rudyard Kipling was the youngest one uh, Nobel laureate. Um, but Hemingway won it at a, at a, you know, in his 50s. Um, of course, he only lived to um, 1960, 1963, Patrick Idaho. And, um, so anyway, he was in Paris, and um, all that stuff happened. And um, one one thing that is a couple of cool things that came out of that were that Hemingway met up with Ezra Pound. And Ezra Pound is kind of the kingmaker of these literary figures because Ezra, I love Ezra Pound's literature for itself. I mean, I think that his verse is superior to many of the other writers at the time. I mean, no, no one remembers Edward Arlington Robinson or you know, any of these people. Um, of course, we remember T.S. Eliot, but Ezra Pound is the one who edited T.S. Eliot. He showed him how to write. And so Ezra Pound and, and Hemingway had a deal. He describes it in a movable feast. If you're going to read a Hemingway book, movable feast is my favorite. Um, it's because it, it was published, it was published posthumously. And um, it's, it's a, 
uh, it's a you know it's a, an autobiographical work it, that that is unlike the other works where we're actually learning about Hemingway and because it, it, it's interesting you know and it's also well written um, and it's more exciting to me than the other books. I mean these two books are amazing, but it's a, a totally different type of work. But in that he talks about F. Scott Fitzgerald how annoying Fitzgerald was to him, um, Fitzgerald and Zelda and their relationship, um, and he says basically that. Two things. One was that he had a kind of a deal with Ezra Pound. Ezra Pound taught him essentially how to write, how, how to be a great writer, not how to write, but how to be, you know, a great writer. And Hemingway gave him boxing lessons. Um, and the other was that they would go out to, to the bars, to the cafes and the bars, and especially at night, James Joyce, who was with them, that's out to Crispy in the old country, um, James Joyce, who was... Uh, who ended up going blind. You know, there's the famous picture of Joyce with his eye patch on. He's a pretty cool looking dude. Um, and Joyce was going blind and he would get violently drunk and he would start uh, running his mouth off and insulting people. And um, Hemingway had to step in and um, defend him and fight for him like a number of times. Um, one of the things that I was reading about recently was, I had forgotten about this, was that Hemingway, Hemingway um, actually got in a fight a full-on fist fight with the poet wallace stevens uh in key west and this is pretty cool now you don't really need to know who wallace stevens is to, to think this is interesting but i'll i'll just i'll tell you anyway um wallace stevens is the pulitzer prize winning poet who was born in uh 1879 um and he um he was interesting because he, he's kind of like T.S. Eliot in the sense that they, you know, these guys lived around the same time. And Wallace Stevens was uh, an executive for a big insurance company, corporation in, in Connecticut. And then he was down on holiday in Florida, a lot of time in Florida. And, and, you know, Hemingway lived in Key West and while Stevens was down there, they were both down there at the same time. So they were totally different figures. Um, T.S. Eliot, remember, was, the, was uh, one of the directors of Lloyd's, I think it was Lloyd's Bank in London and then became an executor at Faber and Faber. I mean, he was a, he was a, he had, uh, he had his wagey. He wasn't just a, a starving poet. Right. And anyway, so one night, um, Wallace Stevens was at the, as uh, he was at sloppy Joe or something in Key West and Hemingway's sister was there. And Wallace Stevens was running his damn, his dang uh, mouth off about how he hated Hemingway and he hated his work. So Hemingway's sister went back to the to the house, and let me see if I can find this picture of the house because it's it's actually pretty cool. Um, went back to the house and said, uh, "Yo, uh, you know, brother Papa or whatever they called him, you know, Ernest. Um, there's this there's this guy, uh, Stevens. That's that's the house in Key West. It's a tourist attraction. It's really cool. It's 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 a cool house. I mean, that's like." It's an amazing house, and it's actually connected to, um, it's connected to the lighthouse in Key West where they filmed that scene in License to Kill, where they take away his license to kill. Remember? Well, and he had the uh, polydactyl cats. They were polydactyl, like, um, like Al Crowley. Yeah, the six-toed cat place, and they're still there. Anyway, so, um. So she went back and she was like, yo, there's this, there's this, uh, there's this fool running his mouth off uh, over a sloppy job. You ought to do something about it. And she didn't need to say that because he immediately like, you know, bam, stormed out of the house, went to sloppy Joe, kicked it. You know, he's about to kick in the door and out comes Wallace Stevens, um, drunk. And Wallace Stevens started running, I'm kind of paraphrasing what happened here, but while Steven, while Stevens started running his mouth off and, um, and Ernest Hemingway. <laughs> Ernest Hemingway uh, knocked him on his ass, and then, I mean, he really he gave him a he gave him a whooping. He whooped his ass, and Wallace Stevens. They were quick to point out, like in the in the newspapers and stuff, that oh, Wallace Stevens, not fair because Wallace Stevens was you know twenty years older. I mean, he was in his fifties though. He was like fifty seven, and Hemingway was thirty seven. That's fine. And Stevens was like this big old fella. And Hemingway, when Hemingway was writing about it, he said, look, I'll, I'm quick. I'll, I'm, 
I, I'm not going to neglect the fact that this dude is, uh, you know, six foot two, 500 pounds, he says. And anyway, Wallace Stevens punched Hemingway in the jaw and broke his fist on Hemingway's jaw. And then got knocked into a puddle. Anyway, that's the Wallace Stevens fight between writers. And it's pretty funny because the way that Hemingway writes in his letters to his publisher, Charles Scribner, is a lot like how um is a lot like how you know the fellas talk. Um, and it's interesting because he's talking to his publisher, but for instance, for instance, it'll be something like, you know, did you see that episode of Geraldo? And Hemingway's like, Geraldo sucks. I want to fight that, I want to fight that fucker for charity, right? <laughs> He says that about a lot of people. He was pretty cantankerous. Um, but anyway, it's pretty interesting. Well, anyway, Hemingway, um, also some other things about him. Um, so he was in, you know, he he was in World War One as it was happening. However brief, he was there. He was also a correspondent during the Spanish Civil War. He was also, most people don't know this, he was present at the Normandy invasion at D-Day. He was there. He was a reporter. So he would have been, you know, in his 40s. But he was there. Um, he also, when he was in, when, uh, yeah, Jerry, <laughs> when he was in Kenya, that's right, I say Kenya. Uh, when he was in Kenya, um, he was in a, he got, he was, you know, he was hunting. He was hunting. And then he got in a, in a plane to go fly off somewhere. And he was in a plane crash. And then within 24 hours, he survived. And then he got in another plane. And then that plane crashed. He was in two, he survived two plane crashes in 24 hours, which is wild, right? He also, I mean, he had his face clawed by a bear, um, but he, all kinds of shit, right? Excuse my language, folks. He ended up moving to Ketchum, Idaho. Now, here's about his, here's about his death. And this is what, something that I've sort of enlightened me in, into the sense that his death isn't, the way that I'd always pictured it before, um, you know, we, we picture that Hemingway took the Cobain way, right? And uh, Norm Macdonald says, what's his expression for it? You know, he pulled that, he pulled that twigger with his um, toe uh, with that 12 gauge, right? And he was like 64, 63 or 64. And we think of this as a, as a, people tend to think of this as a, simplistic sort of bookend to his worldview, okay? Meaning that, you know, th this is one of the things that really is prevalent in terms of, like, getting into the, the latter part of the 60s and then moving all the way to now, which is that, you know, real men cry, um, you know, and they don't stuff their feelings way down because they'll end up like Hemingway. Hemingway. Well, that's not what happened. Um, Hemingway, as I just mentioned, was in a war. He witnessed another war. Um, he uh, witnessed all kinds of things, and he had this family history or whatever. And because of this and his his drinking, um, he finally like somehow got in contact with May with the well, let's just say a certain clinic. Okay, and he went there and basically said like, "Look, what's what's happening." And they immediately gave him electroshock and wiped his mind. And so right after that, he had no access to his memories and he had no creativity left. And so that's what happened. Now, um, I'm not going to say, like, uh, my opinions on that too much other than to say that, like, at the very least, that is not that is not the way that I'd always thought about Hemingway or the way that I think most people think about him. Uh, just digging a little bit deeper and you see that there was something else. And, you know, he was, you know, he was already getting older, but, but that, that ruined him. Um, and so that's what ended up happening. Um, now he, he, of course, has a, th that way out, uh, it, you know, sucks. And that um, like has been prevalent with his, with his family. Um, but I just think it puts things in perspective. I don't know. I don't know really what to think about that. Um, much besides, I mean, I do, but I, I'm not really going to say, um, but I think that that sucks. And also it also sucks that, Hey, what's up, Rachel, Rachel, Rachel came in cause she heard me talking about the Upers. Um, 
So I, it sucks that, you know, hopefully, hopefully by the end, Hemingway found some, you know, found his way into, um, you know, uh, understand, I guess, seeking salvation, right? And understanding, he, he, I mean, this guy needed some grace, okay? And it was there for him. So hopefully he, hopefully he um, found it. Um, but let's dive into his, uh, these two works that I uh, tore through. In Our Time is pretty easy. You know, it's an easy read. I read this, uh, my... I read it April of 2000, so it must have been, I was in a, in my first year of college, I was in some, you know, a literature class, and then I'd never read A Farewell to Arms. I read, I've read um, Movable Feast and The Sun Also Rises and the Nick Adams stories and all the, you know, all that stuff. But um, I just decided to go back to these two works because they're in the 20s and they're really what made Hemingway famous um, and established a, a modern a modernist movement for, especially for American prose writers. So um, before I dive into those, you guys, please smash that like, share the stream. We got a lot of stuff coming up. We've got um, the next one I'm going to do after this, the next work of literature. And I, I, I call this literature because it is, this is a great book is, and we're doing this for our homeboy out there, John Connor, the real John Connor shouts out to him um, for his support. Uh, we're going to do um, Norm Macdonald's Based on a True Story, not a memoir. So we're going to cover this one next. Um, and we've also got a bunch of works coming up, uh, a bunch of books on the way. Um, Titus Andronicus by Shakespeare. We're going to cover the Titus movie starring um, Anthony Hopkins. What else? Um, we're going to be doing a, I might as well just say it, we're going to be doing um, that Seagal stream, that Stefan Seagal stream that we talked about a long time ago. We're finally getting to that. So I've got the Seagal book <laughs> on the way. And we're going to cover like Out for Justice, Hard to Kill, Mark for Death, Above the Law. Above the Law is great because there's a line in it where he says, you know, some people think they're above the law. Well, guess what? You aren't. <laughs> right. You can take that to the bank. Um, yo, anybody seen Richie? Anybody seen Richie? What about you, Bobby Lupo? So we're going to cover Seagal. We're going to do a Seagal super stream. And uh, coming up next week, of course, we've got our homeboy, Chase Haggard. He's going to join us. And we're going to cover, I put it up on the community tab. We're going to, the community tab. We're going to cover um, tortured artists. The, the the theme and the tropes of the tortured artist. So we're going to cover Damien Chazelle's Whiplash, Darren Aronofsky's Black Swan, and Inyaritu's Birdman. Put some respect on my name. So that's going to be fun. Um, we also have, I'm going to be doing Kari Mora, which is the Thomas Harris novel. Um, and let's see, I've got to get to um, the Iliad. I'm going to do Homer's Iliad. I'll probably end up doing Virgil's Aeneid um, later on. Um, got to do Truman Capote's In Cold Blood. We've got to do, I mean, we got, I'm going to do The Mosquito Coast, Paul Thoreau. Um, let's see, High Wind in Jamaica. That'll be, that'll be not soon, but it will be in the future. Also, our Wes Anderson stream. So we're going to be doing a lot of stuff. Uh, so that takes a lot of reading. So that takes a lot of reading. It takes money to get those books. So if you want to support me, I would really appreciate it. If you got, if you supported me um, directly through the links, Cash App, PayPal, Venmo, et cetera, or you can drop a super chat. That'll get to me after a while, but I appreciate that. You can also go back and watch the previous couple of um, streams that we just did. We did Ender's Game with our homeboy, Andy BPF from The Crucible. We did, um, yeah, we've done so many. I don't even remember what we've done. We, we did uh, the Monarch stream on Glamorama. We've done a bunch. So please go back and, and watch our streams. We just did um, the age letters with uh, Jerry showed up. We got the age letters by William Burroughs. And uh, so, you know, please help me out because I could really use it. So that being said, um, oh, the, we've got to do the keep. Also the Michael Mann film. We got to do the crossing by Cormac McCarthy. There's just, there's a lot. It never, it never stops. We're going to keep grinding. And a couple of works for reference for this, before I dive into those, are one, um, Wallace Stevens's Harmonium. That's his book of poems, just talking about Wallace Stevens. And of course, we've done an Ezra Pound stream, but um, we've got Ezra Pound selected poems, selected cantos. 
this is a great biography of of um Ezra Pound, The Last Rower by C. David Heyman. It's a great book on Ezra Pound. Um, this work, which is I read all the time, I still read all the time. It's one of my favorite books because because it's it's just it's a beautiful book, and that's Ezra Pound's Personae. And then um and, and one thing about that book is I'll never forget my first year of college. I was walking across campus and the guy um, who was directing the play, I was in a Shakespeare play. I was playing Benedict in, in Much Ado About Nothing. And um, the director came up to me and he said, he said, what you reading there? And I said, uh, and I had Ezra Pound's persona in my hand. And he said, did you know that persona means mask? Think about that. And such a 30 second conversation that affected me for the rest of my life. Um, because I thought that it, it's, it's those little, it's those little moments where you get insight into the, you know, etymology. And that really, that really affected me, especially the way that I write. Um, and then we've got the, <laughs> our friend Beginsky says, I seem to be kind of sad today. <laughs> no, I ain't sad. Um, maybe it's the work. Maybe it's maybe it's the looming work, and it affected me more than I think. Um, but yeah, I'm all right. Hope everybody's all right out there. It's it is February, so it is. You know, we are in the depths of winter. Maybe somebody's watching this in the summertime, and and it's, you know, six months from now, and it's a bright sunny day outside. I hope it is, and then they can see some contrast. But um, but um. You know, it's it, it's a dark time, dark time for our, our some of our friends and for our family. It's been a tough year, but you know what? We got to keep on rolling. You got to keep on living, y'all. L I V I N. Um, yeah. Again, it's literary essays of Ezra Pound. If you are a writer or a poet, or you want to understand literature, art, and culture, you know, I can't think of anybody better to start with in terms of writing, and especially modern writing, than Ezra Pound and his essays. Very important. Um. And then I've got, um, let's see, T.S. Eliot's Wasteland and his selected poems here. And then I've got this um, Harold Bloom, a bunch of Harold Bloom essays on Hemingway. Okay, so let's dive into A Farewell to Arms. What is it about? Um, there's one particular passage in this that really affected me, yes. Um, and I think that that's good. I think that's a good thing to to have, a again, a, like a personal connection to what you're reading. Or else, why not? Why read, right? So, Farewell to Arms is about this guy, um, and he is an ambulance driver in Italy in World War One. And what happens is basically that he's kind of drifting along through life, and um, he meets this woman, Catherine Barkley, that he immediately. He doesn't immediately fall in love because he doesn't believe in love, but then he's in love with her. And there's a kind of a, some of the struggle is, is an inner struggle about what is love to him. Is it, is it lust or does, is it love? Is it actual love? And the relationship is odd between the two of them because what ends up happening is they, um, they get together and then she gets pregnant. She's going to have a child and they're not married. Um, and that's one of the reasons for like some of the censorship of the book, but but also this fits into the the kind of the essence of modernity and the way that things are gonna go forward. But that's one of the conflicts in the book, right? Because they wanna get married. Well, and it ends up happening basically that he, he goes back to the front and he's sitting there. Um, he goes in, he sees some officers inside and, you know, he's already an outsider cause he's an American. He's and he's in the Italian army. Everyone that he meets thinks that he's either like German or, you know, they question why he's there in the first place, but he's just, he's, he volunteered. He's there for the, for, for action or whatever. Um, not to simplify it, but he goes into a, a little bunker and he's talking to some officers and they're sitting there drinking and wine and eating cheese. And somebody says there's a mortar attack you know, uh, around the corner here, you know, we ought to be careful. And they're like, ah, you know, it'll, whatever. And next thing you know, um, a mortar comes and he finds himself, the bunker's destroyed and a bunch of people are dead. 
and his leg is all messed up. And then he kind of he kind of wakes up out of the fog and gets out of the bunker. And then he's put on a stretcher and he's sent to the hospital and he's recovering. And then one of his friends comes in and says, you know, I'm so glad you're alive. Um, what you did was very brave. And his response is like, brave? I, what do you mean? I was just, we were all just chilling in there. And the friend is like, I'm going to nominate you for the bronze star, maybe even the silver star. Um, who, how many people did you save? And he's like, I didn't, I didn't save anybody. And the guy's like, yeah, but people saw you carrying people out of the bunker. And he's like, I don't, how many did you carry? And he's like, I don't know. Uh, may, maybe someone. Um, and then he says, you're so heroic. You're such a brave man. And he says, he says, I was eating cheese. And that's brilliant because the book is funny. It's a, it's a funny book. Because this is one of the works that we you know, remember when we covered All Quiet on the Western Front, where there's this, there's this like juxtaposition between the way that the the young dudes who are signing up for the war think that the war is going to be, they think it's going to be one way, and then it ends up being something completely different. They think, like in All Quiet on the, on the Western Front, they think it's going to be they're going to be cavalry charges and they're going to have sabers and they're going to be in the, you know, it's, it's like they're in the continental army again or something like thinking back to Napoleon in France or like in the, you know, in the war of Northern aggression. Right. And that they're going to be um, riding off into glorious battle. And what ends up happening is that you get destroyed eating cheese on your time off. And so that affects the way that he thinks um, about the world, and he sees Catherine. He wants to. He wants to be with her. Um, he recovers. His, you know, he, his knee is all messed up. He gets plates in it and all this stuff, and he recovers. And then he goes off again, and this time he deserts um, from the Italian army. Now it's it's weird because he's deserting, but it's not even his army, right? I wasn't even in their fucking army anymore. Remember Willard in uh, Apocalypse Now, and. Then what happens is he's escaping through the countryside and um, at one point um, he sees some, some, some dudes that are about to loot a house and he tells them, go back inside and return that shit. And they do it. And then at another point, there's two guys that are running off and he thinks that they're going to get caught um, because these guys are run they're, they're running away also, which is the irony is that they're running away from the running away. And um, they shoot him. And the main character, Henry, he shoots this guy. And the other guy goes over and does the coup de grace. And, like, the way that he... There's a, there's a Chekhov's gun that appears early in the book. And then later he goes, he finds that the, they make all the ambulance guys, like, carry a gun. But the gun is worthless. You can't hit anything with it. So then he goes and buys another one. And then at this point, it's used, right? And he has, like, he doesn't seem to have any feelings about it, but his feelings are all interior through the pros. We can, we can get that. Then he um, makes his way to a train. He hops a train he has, he, and he makes his way through the countryside. Um, this occurs in, in our time. Also, he gets beaten up by, by, by on a train. Um, and um, then they get captured by these Italian officers and the Italian officers are interrogating everybody and they're, they're shooting them. And, um, one of the things he says is that, like, they take this Italian colonel who I guess just happens to be there, and they say, um, you're a German. We know you're a German. And the, and the colonel says, look, if you're going to do it, just do it. I'm tired of the stupid questions. So they take him off, and they shoot him by the river. And so Hemingway – I mean, not Hemingway. The character in this, um, Henry, knows that they're going to they're gonna die. So he, like, kind of punches his way through the guys and runs down, and he jumps in the river. And he escapes in the river. And this is a kind of a baptismal scene because when he emerges from the river, like he's a, he knows that he has to survive and he has to get back to Catherine. Um, and he makes his way back um, with Catherine. They escape from Italy. They, they cross the frontier. They make their way to uh, Switzerland. They got to get to Switzerland. They make their way in a, in a small boat. Um, they end up in Switzerland. They get arrested. They know they're going to get arrested, but they they get arrested um, and ask for their papers. They have papers. They have, he has his passport, and um, she makes she's she's like useful because she helps to make up the quick lies about where they've been. 
because the Swiss are like, where have you been? There's a war right over there. Are you coming from the war? And she's like, no, we're, we're boating enthusiasts. We love to get in the boat. And they're like, where are your fishing rods? And she's like, well, we came here for sport. Um, and we're hoping to go to Montreux. Um, we want to go, we want to go skiing. And they're like, and then later Henry's like, well, how'd you think of Montreux? And she's like, well, it was the first person, first place I thought of. Um, and they're like, don't go to Montreux. You need to go to this other place. And then they get into talk about sport. And, uh, and so they're successful. And then they end up in this, um, you know, mountain lodge. And then later, um, she, her pregnancy, her pregnancy takes forever because the book is like over a short period of time, but it seems so long because of the amount of detail. And then finally she's about to get to, to deliver birth. I mean, to uh, give birth. And, um, of course, what do you think happens? And this is why this is why it's a dark book. Well, um, she's a, she's giving birth, and the baby is delivered, and he sees the baby, and then um, he finds out that the baby was stillborn, and so he's lost his child, and it, it I mean it sucks, and then she hemorrhages and she dies, and so he's lost everything, and then the book ends with him walking outside into the rain. And that's the book. Now, um, in our time is different because parts of that uh, occur in, in our time. But again, it's a series of vignettes. But one of the things that we get from this is that Hemingway, and I know this about Hemingway's autobiography, that he um, was in, he, when, he was, when he was in, it, in Italy, he met a woman that he fell in love with, and then he came back to America expecting her to come to uh, marry him, okay? And, um, and then she never comes. So not to psychoanalyze, but for the rest of his life, I think in his relationships, that's why he had the relationships that he did and always cut them off because of a fear, a fear that this was going to happen to him. Um, at least that's what is said by people. But I can... I can, um, I can see that happening because I think people kind of have experienced, you know, love is, a you know, it's a MF or as he says in, um, in, uh, old school remember? Um, and, but what I'm saying is that that affects him, um, for the rest of his life and that the character in this is broken in a way that he ends up in what he calls, he says the the um broken places in life and that's a particularly um significant passage that i'm going to get to because it's it's pretty dark so um let's see let's let's start off again the book was published as a farewell to arms is published in 1929 and um uh chapter one i wrote brief chapter with Anne's mimicking the voice of the child speaker so he clearly got this uh, from either directly from james joyce i mean as a a writer, I guess I can see the in the outside influence, and not to be wanky about it, but I can see the out, outside influence in terms of the revision of his work. I think it's brilliant. But leaving that aside, what he does here is brilliant because he's speaking in the voice, in the voice of the child, and he says, "In the late summer of that year, we lived in a house in a village that looked across the river and the plains to the mountains." In the bed of the river, lots of prepositions and prepositional phrases. In the bed of the river, there were pebbles and boulders dry and white in the sun, and the water was clear and swiftly moving and blue in the channels. Groups went by the house and down the road in the dust, and they raised and they raised powdered the leaves of the trees. The trunks of the trees, too, were dusty, and the leaves fell early that year, and we saw the troops marching along the road and the dust rising and leaves stirred by the breeze falling and the soldiers marching, and afterward the road bare and white except for the leaves. Now, that is a... Uh, really a a Whitman-esque microcosm for the way that the whole story is because he see, he's there, he sees nature, he sees the, the soldiers coming by, the war is like in fits and starts, and then it leaves, it leaves, pun, leaves, he, and he sees the leaves, and nature, you know, leaf subsides to leave, and then nature turned to grief. Um, um, in chapter two, I wrote um, adverbs and conjunctions match the child speaker, the description, matter of fact, uh, modernity. So, for instance, he says, 
The next year, there were many victories. The mountain that was beyond the valley and the hillside where the chestnut forest grew was captured, and there were victories beyond the plain on the plateau to the south, and we crossed the river in August and lived in a house in Gorizia that had a fountain and many thick shady trees and a walled garden and wisteria vine purple on the side of the house. Long sentence. But do you see how the, the ands, the conjunctions are continuously kind of rolling out the landscape? And that's also the interior landscape of the speaker. So wisteria, I don't know. I don't know if they have that up north, y'all, but wisteria is an invasive vine that is quite beautiful when it blooms, but you got to cut that back. You got to get that back. Don't let it grow over the garage. It looks beautiful and it frames the garage, but that old, that, that stalk is, is big. You got to get the, the, the chainsaw out there. Now the fighting was in the next mountains beyond and was not a mile away. The town was very nice and our house was very fine. You hear the adverbs? The river ran behind us and the town had been captured very handsomely, but the mountains beyond it could not be taken. And I was very glad the Austrians seemed to want to come back to the town sometime if the war should end because they did not bombard it to destroy it, but only a little in a military way. Child, it's, it's childlike. The, the sentences are are long and fluid and with lots of adverbs. And we see the youth of the speaker, at least the youth, this sort of unspoiled youth at the beginning of the book. Um, Shouts out also to Toledo because a while back I saw her mention something about uh, Midnight in Paris. And that's one of the few uh, Woodrow Allen movies that I like um, because it's got Owen Wilson. Yeah. Wow. I met Hemingway. And it's got Leah C. Do. C. C. Do. In it. Leah C. Do. C. Do. Not C. Do. That's a, that's a Danny McBride jet ski. Um, Leah Cido, that, you know, the French actress who is pretty fine. Um, but there's a scene where he meets, he meets Hemingway in the bar and the dude who plays Hemingway, he remember he was in house of cards. Um, that, that dude it, like does a great Hemingway because he's like, I was on the front and it was very nice. And the, the land was scarred and I was sad. And, the trees were blooming. I had a gun, right? He's just, he's, he, 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 he's good at playing Hemingway, which is tough because there aren't Hemingway is one of those writers where they've made, um, a bunch of movies that, you know, adaptations of his books, um, in the movies and they never work well. They had the Gary Cooper one. They had the, the rock Hudson farewell to arms shouts out to a uh, Claire out there. Beautiful Claire who, um, who brought up the, the rock Hudson, um, version of this book and they just never do them well there was also there was let me see if i got a picture of it there was also the um the gellhorn movie here's here's wallace stevens by the way that's hemingway and that's wallace stevens on the right he's a big fella um and what was the gellhorn movie about hemingway with clive owen it's cool that they got clive owen to, to play him Here's Hemingway. Here's Papa Hemingway, right? Wholesome. Wholesome. Um, and then here he is with his, here he is with his BFF, right? <laughs> Hanging out in Cuba. Uh, um, Fidel was a, liked Hemingway. He was a big fan of Hemingway. Here he is um, hanging out with the fellas in, I guess, he's probably in San Sebastian there. Um, or he's in, I don't know where he is right there, but that's Elder Hemingway. Um, I don't think I have the picture here. There's a great, it's not a great, um, there's a movie with Clive Owen and, um, uh, Creeper and Nicole Kidman. Um, and it's not great, but it's interesting because they have, uh, because Clive Owen plays Hemingway. And if anybody's going to play him, it's, it's probably Clive. I like Clive Owen. Like, I don't know if I've ever seen a Clive Owen movie that I didn't like. That dude's cool. He's a, you know, he's a dude. Right. He's a, he's in children of men. I mean, come on, right. Children of men rules. It's a great movie. He was in sin city. He's great in that because you don't even, it's like, I don't even really think of him being in that because you got Mickey Rourke and Benicio, but Clive Owens, like the guy in that, um, he's even good in that movie duplicity, which is a pretty clever movie with, uh, Paul Giamatti, um, about, big uh far big farms let's say and they have a cure for something and it's so it's kind of corporate warfare so that's pretty good um yeah gary cooper was uh as far as i know gary cooper was was 
uh, uh, pretty chattish, right? So he's pretty cool. Um, they did the snows of Kilimanjaro with uh, Gregory Peck. Hear me back, my family. He's kind of a Gregory Peck is kind of a proto Harrison Ford. Like he's the same guy in a way. Um, but anyway, so they don't do really good movies versions of him anyway. But Clive Owen was good at playing him for what the movie was. Um, so let's see. Let's move on um, to another section. He mentions. <laughs> On page eight, Luminate Confirm, the, the guys are, the fellows are sitting around talking. And he says, it says, it's very valuable, says the lieutenant, the lieutenant. He tells you about the, those priests who will like it. I smiled at the priest and he smiled back across the candlelight. Don't you read it? He said, I will get it for you, said the lieutenant. All th then he says, the major says, all thinking men are atheists, cringe. I do not believe in the Freemasons, however. Then this character, the lieutenant, says, I believe in the Freemasons. It is a noble organization. Someone came in as the door as the door opened. I could see the snow falling. So it's interesting, just small tidbit in the book, but about how they are discussing the causes for the war and the way that the war is running, and they specifically mention a, a certain group, right? Um, and what, what's happening in this scene is interesting because the priest is a one of the humble virtuous characters in the book who is made fun of by these um atheistic soldiers in the war and he takes it in stride he doesn't bite back because he knows that what they're going through they can they can they can shower him uh with with all the stuff that they want to right all the words that they want to but it's not going to change the fact that they're there and that he's hoping that, you know, one day they will come, uh, they will come about. Um, and it's interesting because Henry is one of these guys, but he finds a kind of a kinship with the priest character because he likes his stoicism. Um, let's see, page, um, pages 20 and 21, we get the picturesque wounds and the romanticism of war. Since the end of 15, 1915, I started when he did. I remember having a silly idea he might come to the hospital where, where I was with a saber cut, I suppose, and a bandage around his head or shot through the shoulder, something picturesque. This captures perfectly um, the dichotomy of the, between the romanticism of war and the reality of war that came about in the modern age and that's perfectly delineated in All Quiet on the Western Front they think they're going to go and they're going to get some sort of, you know, noble wound, right? And they end up with these grizz in these grisly situations. Um, this is a, the picturesque front. I said, yes. She said, people can't realize what France is like. If they did, it, it, couldn't, it couldn't all go on. He didn't have a saber cut. They blew him all to bits. There you go. Um, on pages, let's see. 39 so this is page 38 he says um i wrote the long sentence structure echoes his nuanced thoughts mixed with his accurate dialogue showing the perfect sequence of concrete tactile events people would not wear any clothes because it was so hot in the window open and the swallows flying over the roofs of the houses and when it was dark afterward and you went to the window very small bats hunting over the houses and close down over the trees and we would drink the capri and door and the door locked and it and it hot and only a sheet and the whole night and we would both love each other all night in the hot night in Milan. That was how it ought to be. I would eat quickly and go and see Catherine Barkley. Um let's see. The Senate structure show versus tell is in is occurs on the next page. He said it was true, and by the corpse of Bacchus. We would test whether it was true or not. Not Bacchus, I said. Not Bacchus. Yes, Bacchus, he said. I should drink the cup for glass. The cup. I should drink cup for cup and glass for glass with Bassi, Filippo Vincenza. Bassi said, no, that was no test because he had already drunk twice as much as I. And I said that was a foul lie. And Bacchus or no Bacchus, Bassi or Bassi, uh, Vincenza had never touched a drop all evening. And what was his name anyway? He said, was my name Fred, uh, Frederico Enrico or Enrico Frederico? I said, let the best man win. Bacchus barred, and the major started us with red wine and mugs. Halfway through the wine, I didn't want any more. I remembered where I was going. 
so th- we get we get the the recounting of a story, but it's interesting because we are shown the events like we're there, right? Um, we get predictions of World War II on page seventy six. Where is Hawaii? It is in the Pacific Ocean. Why did the Japanese want it? They don't really want it. I said that's all talk. The Japanese are a wonderful little people, fond of dancing and light wines, like the French. Said the major. We will get Nice and Savoia from the French. We will get Corsica and all the Adriatic coastline, Rinaldi said. Italy will return to the splendors of Rome, said the major. I don't like Rome, I said. It's hot and full of fleas. You don't like Rome? Yes, I love Rome. Rome is the mother of nations. I will never forget Romulus suckling the Tiber. What? Nothing. Let's all go to Rome. Let's go to Rome tonight and never come back. Rome is a beautiful city, said the major. The mother and father of nations, I said. Roma is feminine, said Rinaldi. It cannot be the father. And then, um, let's see, um, page 77, I've vomited into a gas mask. And the way the way that they say goodbye to each other is so typical of the way that, it's interesting because the way, the way that people get off the phone in America is so different from the way they get off the phone in, in um, Northern Ireland and in England. When people get off the phone, there they say right bye bye cheers bye 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 okay bye bye like a hundred times and of course in america you're on the phone and you're like all right peace beep right or or somebody just hangs up before the end of the conversation right all right beep but what they do here is he mirrors that there are too many women here at the front they send some back how do you like that all right yes you go to live in a big city and have your english there to cuddle you um, we drink and make noise and disturb Federico. Don't go. Yes, we must go. Goodbye. Good luck. Many things. Ciao, ciao, ciao. Come back quickly. Rinaldi, yeah, you, goodbye, goodbye. Many things. The, ma- the major patted my shoulder. They tiptoed out. I found I was quite drunk, but went to sleep. G- goodbye a hundred times. Um, let's see. Um, Later on, we follow his thoughts. Um, When he's in Switzerland, I wrote, we follow the speaker and his thoughts, unpredictability, iceberg theory, and ellipsis, and grace under pressure. Grace under pressure is really, really comes out in Hemingway's work, uh, The Sun Also Rises, because this it's essentially just a a stoic attitude, right? Um, That when the worst comes to worse, one has to be a man. Um, And... This comes out in this scene when we find out that the character, Henry, all of a sudden wants to go to Switzerland. What's he want to do? He wants to go to Switzerland and escape. And that's interesting because that's like, it's unpredictable. You can't predict that in the novel. And that's what makes it, again, interesting writing is because um, we're go- we are in the, one, one thing about Hemingway and about great novels, especially is what Jack Kerouac said about believing the holy contour of life. You're, when you're reading you like get into this wave and um, you, you kind of just, you go, the story takes you with it. And I think that that's one thing about reading that a lot of, not to speak on reading too much, but that's what people don't really understand about reading that don't read a lot is the sense that how did you read all these pages? Well, it's not about the, the, the breadth of the book. It's about having the stamina to be in the mindset of the speaker and you just go with the story and, and the pages fly by. Right. And that's, that is what happens in, in Hemingway. Um, so you're surprised when you come across these events that it's almost living completely in the moment. He doesn't, it's not that he doesn't believe in a past or a future. It's that he, he has only a concept of the now. And although I don't like that and I disagree with that, especially in terms of a worldview, I understand what he's saying. Um, on page four, uh, 245, he says, don't talk about the war, I said. The war was a long way away. Maybe there wasn't any war. There was no war here. Then I realized it was over for me, but I did not have the feeling that it was really over. I had the feeling of a boy who thinks of what is happening at a certain hour at the schoolhouse from which he has played truant, which is interesting because bringing in the 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 schoolhouse imagery shows that he still has this sense of innocence about him where he but instead of being completely innocent he has been experienced in a blakeian sense he's been experienced by the war and now 
he is he is hearkening back to what he wishes he could he wishes he could go back to his youth by shutting it off by shutting off the current events um shouts out to everybody out there thank you for joining me on this uh whatever day this is um appreciate y'all coming by for Hemingway and if there's any if there are any super chats I'll get to those at the end um let's see uh while while I'm at it cuz I just pulled this up I might as well give some shouts out um to people who have supported me thank you so much shouts out to Jonathan out there who sends 5 bucks and he says you made me read gooder <laughs> that's awesome homeboy that that really um that that really uh uh makes me happy right thank you so much for that appreciate that um yo shouts out to our homeboy out there TH Thomas Henderson the Kang who sends uh Twenty dollars via PayPal. Thank you so much, Thomas. Really appreciate you. Appreciate your insights, also. Thomas Henderson is a high IQ um, OG friend of ours. Um, shouts out to our homeboy Stephen Mulraney out there who sends twenty bucks via PayPal. Really appreciate your homeboy. Thank you so much. That means a, a whole lot to me. Um, and so I'll get to any more super chats we have uh, at the end. Uh, shouts out to our homeboy Jerry out there also for being with us, exposing powerful lies, live streams. Thank you so much for being here, Jerry. Appreciate you. Um, let's see. Um, later on, when Henry meets up with Catherine Barkley, he, he is with one of her friends, um, an English, an, an English friend, and she really puts it to Henry. And it's interesting because of his attitude, he doesn't respond, he just lets her talk. Um, and she says, I'm, she says, I'm not cheered by seeing you. I know the mess you've gotten this girl into. You're no cheerful sight to me because she's gotten, he's gotten her pregnant and they're not married. Um, and so she is um, understandably pissed that he is doing this to her friend. But she says, I can't stand him. He's done nothing but ruin you with his sneaking Italian tricks. Americans are worse than Italians. Catherine says the Scotch are such moral people, right? She's uh, she's Scottish, not English. Um, and she says, I don't mean that. I mean his Italian sneakiness. Am I sneaky, Fergie? You are. You're worse than sneaky. You're like a snake, a snake with an Italian uniform with a cape around your neck. I haven't gotten an Italian uniform now. That's just another example of your sneakiness. You had a love affair all summer and got this girl with child, and now I suppose you'll sneak off. Catherine says, uh, we'll both sneak off. You're two of the same thing, Ferguson said. I'm ashamed of you, Catherine Barkley. You have no shame and no honor, and you're as sneaky as he is. Don't, Fergie, she says. Don't denounce me. You know we like each other. Take your hand away, Ferguson said. Her face was red. If you had any shame, it would be different. But your God knows how many months gone with child, and you think it's a joke, and, and are all smiles because your seducers come back. You've got no shame and no feelings. She began to cry. I'm not crying, Ferguson said. I'm not crying, except for the awful thing you've gotten into. He looked at me. I hate you, she said. You can't make me not hate you, you dirty, sneaking American Italian. Her eyes and nose were red with crying. This is a, this is a great scene. This, this, this one really gets me because the, the woman is right. And Catherine is annoying because, first of all, when they go on their date, when they, when they first go on their date, um, when Henry goes on his date with Catherine, um, they embrace, and she immediately is like, will you love me forever? And he's like, whoa, hold on there for a minute. But what she's doing here is she wants, she wants love. She wants to be loved, and she wants to give love. Now, that's, that's a little interesting because in the rest of the book, she, it's through the eyes, of course, of Henry, so he doesn't say everything that she says, but she wants a life together. And he is... Of course, he didn't wait um, to marry her, but he wants to to get married. You know, the war is on, but everybody else is getting married right during the war. And so he puts it off. And this is because he is the opposite. He doesn't believe in love. Right. John B says, promise me you'll never die. And that's ironic because she's the tragic character. She she dies. And not only does she die, she takes the past with her because she dies, and she takes the future with her because their child dies. And so, again, Henry is left with exactly what he wanted, which is the present moment. 
he has no no past and no future. And he walks into the rain. He walks into the rain like like Robert Frost acquainted with the night. Right. And we know that he's like dead inside. But the thing is, is like you wanted this, dude. This is exactly what you wanted. Also, the imagery with the snake is interesting because I wrote CF page 170. On page 170, um, Henry's talking to this to his friend Rinaldi. And Rinaldi says, um, let's see. Um the old Superman, I said, I'm jealous, maybe, Rinaldi said. No, you're not. I don't mean like that. I mean something else. Have you any married friends? Yes, I said. I haven't, Rinaldi said. Not if they love each other. Why not? They don't like me. Why not? I am the snake. I am the snake of reason. And he says, you're getting it mixed. The apple was reason. No, it was the snake. He was more cheerful. Okay. Right. You're better when you don't think so deeply, I said. I love you, he said. You puncture me when I become a great Italian thinker, but I know many things I can't say. I know more than you. Yes, you do. But you will have a better time. Even with remorse, you will have a better time. Even with remorse. So we know that he will have remorse, right? But it's interesting because now he is called the snake. He is the serpent, right? He's ruined her. Um, it's interesting that also that his love is what, it's again, it's like an apocalypse now, right? Remember in the apocalypse now redux, when Willard meets the, the French plantation scene, he meets the, the Jean-Tus or whatever, you know, and she's offering the opium pipe and she says, you see, there are two of you, one that loves and one that kills. So again, in war, in the wartime setting, we have this weird line of, Love and death. And of course, this ties into the French idea. They're, you know, they're talking about the French, and this is the French idea of the big O, right? Le petit mot, the little death. So death is tied in with a kind of a sexual energy. And this is exactly what he wants. We find that he is regretful and that he doesn't want it, but he is, he is, he is doing the things that Fer that Fergie says that he's doing, which is he is sneaking around. That's literally what he's been doing. He snuck off. He snuck off like a snake. And then he and then he got on the train and he made his way, you know, snaking through the countryside. He um made his way out of the river, snaking through the grass. Right? He so so it's like this is what you know, Harold Bloom makes a good point because he says that Hemingway is essentially just espousing the American Gnostic religion, right? Remember, we talked about that when in the Melville streams where where you know Melville says basically the the American religion, this is a you know, he's he's being this is a figurative and it's metaphorical, but it's also pretty insightfully metaphysical where he says that the American religion, because America has no state religion is the religion of a kind of mix of Gnosticism and Pentecostalism. And that is really in a way what Hemingway represents in his writing, because it's about how the world is broken. It's a prison planet. It's the broken world. And he needs to, he is, he, he, he seeks a kind of perfection in the moment. Right. He seeks a sort of transcendence in the moment. But it's it's also odd because it's a it it becomes this existentialist thing where it's like he is on the verge of the abyss. I mean, think about it, how the character and, and even the sun also rises, but the character is standing on the verge of the abyss in terms of the wasteland, the no man's land and the and the trenches. So there's an abyss down below, right? It's like what Rambo says, heaven is above, hell is certainly down below. And he wants to be in this, right? Um, and it's not just the fact that he doesn't say what he feels, it, we, because we get what he feels through showing us the imagery and through, through, his, through his actions. But it's the, fa it's the fact that when he comes to something meaningful like the talk of the soul, he just negates it. it. It's just, it's what it's, it's, you know, this leads into the postmodernism of William Burroughs when we just covered with Jerry and William Burroughs talks about like the postmodern man is essentially one of negation. He defines himself by what he is not instead of what he is. Um, okay. So in page 249 here, 
uh, we get this really, I mean, this is the key passage in the whole book for me. Um, and you can always tell when you're going to get to the key passage, especially in Hemingway, because we have a long, unbroken block of prose. So we know we're going to have chunks. We're not going to have dialogue. The dialogue in In Our Time is so different because the characters speak freely, and this they don't. Um, so here's what he says. This is the crux of the whole book. He says, that night at the hotel, this is page 249, in our room with the long, empty hall outside and our shoes outside the door, a thick carpet on the floor of the room outside the windows, the rain falling in, in the room, light and pleasant and cheerful. Then the light out and... It exciting with smooth sheets in the bed, comfortable feeling that we had come home, feeling no longer alone, waking in the night to find the other one there and not gone away, semicolon. All other things were unreal. We slept when we were tired, and if we woke, the other one woke too, so no one was not alone. Often a man wishes to be alone, and a girl wishes to be alone too, and if they love each other, they are jealous of that in each other. But I can truly say we never felt that. We could feel alone when we were together, alone against the others. It has only happened to me like that once. I've been alone while I was with many girls, and that is the way that you can be most lonely. But we were never lonely and never afraid of when we were together. I know that the night is not the same as the day, that all things are different, that the things of the night cannot be explained in the day because they do not then exist. And the night can be a dreadful time for lonely people because once their loneliness has started. But with Catherine, there was almost no difference in the night except that it was an even better time. If people bring so much courage to this world, the world has to kill them to break them. So of course it kills them. The world breaks everyone and afterward many are strong at the broken places. But those that will not break it kills. It kills the very good and the very gentle and the very brave impartially. If you are none of these, you can be sure it will kill you too, but there will be no special hurry. So that's Hemingway's, I mean, that's the worldview. That is, that is the novel. That's Hemingway's work right there. If you, if you don't know anything about, else about Hemingway, that's it. So notice what Bloom calls the sort of American Gnosticism in this, right? The world is broken, everything's broken, and it's going to break you too. Now, that's not to say that there's not truth in that, in the sense that, that you know, I think what, what the speaker here is misunderstanding is the fact that his view, right, is that he is, he's essentially godless, okay, because he thinks that the world has been broken before he gets here. He has nothing and he's going to just cross this abyss and he lives in the present time. And that's, that's what he does. Right. But it doesn't have to be this way. Right. You, you have a, he has a soul, right? He can, he can, he sees beauty. Why not see the transcendent, the metaphysical beauty of the world, right? It's not a, it's not a broken world. Creation is beautiful. And we understand his feelings and his brokenness because we know at this point that he's going to break in terms of his psyche and that, that his wife is going to break because she's going to die. And there is death, but we live in a fallen world and, and that's the way it is. But like when you live in the moment, you know, I, I feel for what he says here about the world breaks out everyone and afterward many are strong at the broken places. That's, that is, that's, that is powerful. It's, it's visceral to me. Many are strong at the broken places, the broken places, right? But we broke those places. People break those places, right? The broken places in the war are because people did that. Right. God is seeking to heal the broken places and to mend them. To heal his soul. But. But he can't he can't see that in this fog, in this kind of egotistical fog. And it, it's a lot. It, it's more complex. I'm trying to simplify how I feel, you know, how I as a reader feel about this. But I think that. It's so painful because. Like any person reading this can like with any amount of experience or, or insight can understand what he's saying here, but there's something else. Right. And, but I do think that there is a beauty here. This is a kind of a Whitman beauty, right? Um, 
you know, what Whitman says, um, you know, I was there, Whitman says, right? Well, well, he was there. This character was there, okay? But he's going to go on. His soul will go on. His love could go on. But he has to, for one, at the very least, he has to understand that what Catherine says, I'm paraphrasing the book, but Catherine says, or one of the characters says to him, basically that love is not like the lust in the pr present moment or the, the fulfillment of the, the basement of the senses, right? Love is giving. Love is the giving, is, is loving. Love is loving someone else. It's the ability to want to, to, to serve, to, to serve God and to serve, to, to serve. It's love. The greatest of these is love. Right. And that, yeah, Thomas Henderson says, God also works through us in our weakness. I mean, absolutely. Right. And he, but he has to, he has to, he has to let that happen. And he's so he's closed off. And I don't mean closed off in a psychiatric way. I mean, closed off in the way that he's like, he's at the edge. Okay. But some, at some point at the edge, you have to, you know, I guess as a, as a human, as a human person, as a man, you have to give yourself up, you know? Um, and, and you have to, you have to love, right? Um, death is not the continuation of the world. Lo love and life continue the world. God continues the world through, through love and through life, life, life proceeds, right? Through creation. Not through constant, it's not, it's not death. Yes, we live in the fallen world, but it's not the death that does that. And um, so, so he goes on and he says, um, he, it's interesting because then he goes on to this pool hall and he meets, uh, he meets this old man. This, old, this guy's an old um, count and they play pool together and the old count is there and the old count he basically says, you know, the character says, Henry, Henry says, um, you're very wise. And the old man says, I'm not so wise. He says, the great fallacy of wisdom is in old age. Uh, old men don't grow wise. They grow careful, which is, which is insightful. Um, but, but that is wise. <laughs> That's a wise statement. And he goes on to, uh, when they make it to Switzerland, uh, um, this is page. 289, he says, um, this is chapter 38. The book's written in four, in four uh, sections, four books. And I thought, reading it, you think that it's going to go on in a, a sort of quasi-Iliad, because he is going he, in a quasi-Homer fashion, because he's going, he's, he's experiencing a personal odyssey, and the books are broken up into 12 chapters. So I thought it was going to continue like that, but then it skews from that because, of course, everything gets skewed in, in the post-Great War modernity, right? There's more, and then there's less. So his, his kind of his bearings are thrown off. He says, we live in a brown wooden house in the pine trees on the side of the mountain. And at night there was frost so that there was thin ice over the water and the two pitchers on the dresser in the morning. Beautiful, uh, you know, beautiful, just sensory details. Um, but he says, um, let's see, they, 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 uh, they go through various villages. Um, and then Catherine is all like at this point in the book, Catherine is like constantly worried about how she looks. She's pregnant. She's heavily pregnant. And she says, I know one thing. I'm not going to be married in this splendid matronly state. You're not matronly. Oh, yes, I am, darling. The hairdresser asked me if this was our first. I lied and said, no, we had two boys and two girls. When will we be married? Anytime after I'm thin again. We want to have a splendid wedding with everyone thinking what a handsome young couple. And you're not worried? Darling, why should I be worried? The only time I ever felt badly was when I felt like a whore in Milan, and that only lasted seven minutes. And besides, it was the room furnishings. She's, she's concentrated on on what she looks. At least she's looking forward to getting married. Um, and then we have the the death of the child and, and her. And this is so painful because um, this is at the the climax of the book. It ends. You can tell that. I mean, I know that Hemingway had had trouble ending the book um, with what he's gone through and that he wanted to call it World Enough in Time. That's a great title. Of course, World Enough in Time comes from Andrew Marvell, right? If we 
in Weeb World enough in time, this coyness lady were no crime because she's a coy. She's it's about it's about carpe diem, seizing the moment, right? Um, gather you rosebuds while you may. Old time is still a flying, and this same flower that smiles today, tomorrow will be dying. Right, says Herrick. So it's like, but anyway. So um, she says on page three twenty seven, or he says on page three twenty seven. Um. I sat down on the chair in front of a table where there were nurses' reports hung on clips at the side and looked out of the windows. I could see nothing but the dark and the rain falling across the light from the windows. So that was it. That's how he sums up what's happened to him. That was it. Um, he says that his child has died. Um, that was why the doctor looked so tired. But why had they acted the way they did in the room with him? They, they supposed he would come around and start breathing probably. I had, he says... He says he had no religion, but I knew he ought to have been baptized. Okay, good. Um, at least he's, he's think he's considering this. But what if he never breathed at all? He hadn't. He had never been alive, except in Catherine. I felt him kick there often enough, but I hadn't for a week. Maybe he was. No, I can't read that. Um, poor little kid. He says that that small sentence, three words, which like really breaks you as a reader, right? Um. He says, I wish the hell I'd been choked like that. No, I didn't. Still, there would not be all this dying to go through. Now Catherine would die. That was what you did. You died. You did not know what it was about. You never had time to learn. They threw you in and told you the rules. And the first time they caught you off base, they killed you. Or they killed you gratuitously like Amo. Or gave you the, the syphilis like Rinaldi. But they killed you in the end. You could count on that. Stay around and they would kill you. Once and it Well, you did have time. Right. And you did know what it was about. But I understand he's in his grief. Uh, once in a camp, I put a log on top of the fire and it was full of ants. I mentioned this passage um, in the stream with Andy, uh, BPF, when we were talking about Ender's Game. Um, As it commenced to burn, the ants swarmed out and went first toward the center where the fire was, then turned back and ran toward the end. When there were enough on the end, they fell off into the fire. Some got out, their bodies burnt and flattened and went off not knowing where they were going. But most of them went toward the fire and then back toward the end and swarmed on the cool end and finally fell off into the fire. I remember thinking at the time that it was the end of the world and a splendid chance to be a messiah and lift the log off the fire and throw it out where the ants could get off onto the ground, but I didn't do anything. or we'll throw a tin cup of water on the log so that I would have the cup empty to put whiskey in before I added water to it. I think the cup of water on the burning log only steamed the ants. Okay, so exactly. You thought you could be a messiah. Well, there's only one. And this is Harold Bloom's American Gnosticism, right? That he's in the broken world. He thinks that he could be the creator. He thinks that he can be the savior, but he doesn't do that. And then he's saying all of this because it is a metaphor, right? He's a, oh, I'm sorry, Amptown. Um, and shouts out, shouts out to Amptown for being a big supporter of the stream. Um, and I'm trying to leave out the really bad parts. Um, but it it is it is heavy. At the end, on page three thirty, he says, "It it is very dangerous." The nurse went into the room and shut the door. I sat outside in the hall. Everything was gone inside of me. I did not think. I could not think. I knew she was going to die, and I prayed she would not die. Don't let her die. Oh God, please don't let her die. I'll do anything for you if you won't let her die. Please, 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 dear God, don't let her die. Dear God, don't let her die. Please, 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 don't let her die. God, please make her not die. I'll do anything you say if you don't let her die. You took the baby, but don't let her die. That was all right, but don't let her die. Please, please, dear God, don't let her die. You see why I was affected by this book? Right. I mean, th that paragraph is so unlike anything in Hemingway or how we think of Hemingway. Because he is at the broken place here, and he is, he is, he is praying. He's reaching out, right? But the repetition of the phrase, the repetition is the repetition of the running line in his head from what he's just witnessed. And then at the end, of course, the very end, he, a doctor tries to talk to him and he says, there's nothing to say. Good night. He said, I cannot take you to the hotel. No, thank you. It was the only thing to do. He said, the operation proved I didn't, I do not want to talk about it. I said, I would like to take you to your hotel. No, thank you. He went down the hall. I went to the door of the room. You can't come in now, one of the nurses said. Yes, I can, I said. You can't come in yet. Yeah, you get out, I said. The other one, too. But after I got them out and shut the door and turned off the light, it wasn't any good. So he goes into the room, and he is lying there with his 
with his wife who's just died and they want they don't want to let him in but he says you get out of the way i'm going to get in the room it was like saying goodbye to a statue after a while i went out and left the hospital and walked back to the hotel in the rain and that's the end of the book Whoo, it's a heavy book so that's a farewell to arms um in our time is different Again, if you want to support me, um, please don't hesitate to uh, send a super chat. Again, I'm reading this. Yes, I read it so you don't have to or read it so you will or whatever. Um, but you see how this is um, relevant and meaningful and how this kind of makes its way um, into th this is such this is so different from the Dickensian way. I mean, not to say that the Dickensian prose is not also truthful and and relevant because it is. But it is, this is written in the mode of the way that writers write now, right? This is the way that writers write now. This is the way that people think now. Um, and so I think it's important to cover. Um, it's also so much more, it's so much deeper and, and harder than our memory of Hemingway. If you haven't gone back and read Hemingway or you've never read him, but what the kind of popular way that people think about him. In Our Time um, was published in 1925, I think. I thought it was 23, but I think it's 25. So it's how amazing is it, right? And we can talk about culture creation, of course. Um, and these people are being promoted by, by the various publishing houses and, you know, what you could kind of see as their agents in terms of the literary culture. I would say though, that Ezra Pound is not one of those people. And he's the most, I mean, he clearly wasn't, you know, Ezra Pound said, um, let's say some controversial things uh, during the war. And he was broadcasting from uh, Pisa and Rapallo. And then during the war talking about the um, F E D R E S E R V E E, et cetera. And then when the Americans invaded and came, they found um, they, had, they had intercepted his broadcasts because he was broadcasting from a wartime from fascist Italy back to America. And they couldn't really comprehend what they couldn't comprehend what he was saying. He was he was he was out there, man. Right. And so they locked him in a cage. Um, he came back to America. He was uh, he was committed to a, a psychiatric institute and took a 10 year vow of silence. Um, and because he said he had nothing else to say, he'd said what he said, and he'd written what he'd written. So I, I think that it's, I don't think that he was one of their people. I mean, T.S. Eliot's different, of course, because he was Lloyd's Bank. Um, but at least that's my take. That's been my take uh, for, you know, about, I don't know, 20 years. 20 years? No, I, I guess I started reading Ezra Pound in like 96. So, um, yeah, 20, 27 years or so, right? The entire lifetime of Jim Morrison is how long I've been reading Ezra Pound, which is a weird way to put it. Um, but anyway, so In Our Time was published um, at the same, in the, around the same time as The Wasteland and The Great Gatsby. Now, we've covered The Great Gatsby, Jeff Stein, Every Great Gatsby. And the obvious correlation between and the reason it's the lost generation is the correlation between Elliot and um, Fitzgerald is is pretty stark, right? Um, it, it, in, in terms of the reader, because Elliot writes The Wasteland, right? April's the cruelest month, breeding lilacs out of the dead land, stirring memory with desire, stirring, stirring dull roots of spring rain. And we have The Wasteland. We have Hemingway's Wasteland mentioned in this in terms of Nick Adams when he's on the, he's on the broken and burned out landscape. And then we have... Um, the uh, Valley of Ashes, right, separating East and West Egg in um, The Great Gatsby. And remember, in The Great Gatsby, the Valley of Ashes essentially serves as the abyss, right, because the characters have to cross the abyss to get to the other side. And this is, of course, where they confront death, um, sort of death incarnate in the, in the actions that occur, the death of Myrtle. Remember that family guy? Have you ever seen... The Family Guy episode of the of some of the famous American novels, uh, when they do The Great Gatsby, it's really good. Myrtle. Oh, Myrtle. Why did I ever meet a girl named Myrtle? <laughs> shirt, shirt, shirt. I'm starting to think this isn't a very good book, he says. <laughs> um, they do Huck Finn and that, and um, 
Then they later do like, what is it? Misery. They do misery by Stephen King. Um, they do stand by me. Um, but they do, they do a pretty good, uh, you know, satirical recap of those. But anyway, um, Oh, one thing I forgot to mention earlier was another one we're going to cover is the beach. We're going to cover Alex Garland's the beach. I ordered a copy so I can reread that because I can't find my copy. Um, I can't find my copy of a movable feast. I can't find my copy of the beach. I couldn't find my son also rises. So they were in a box that I don't have anymore. I can't find, they're not in this library. They're not in the other room. They're not in the other room. So, um, help me to buy books, people, please. You can click that super chat button right there, or you can send me, um, you can send me, uh, your, your very, uh, gracious donos. Um, you are the gracious ones, um, for sending me the, I mean, I mean, I am grateful to you. That's very sw sweet of you to do that is what I mean. You know what I mean? Um, I'm just sitting here reading, uh, you know, reading this old book with thoughts in the old skull. I'm not really doing anything. So, um, so this book again is interesting because it's a series of vignettes. Um, and short stories that are uh, that are sequenced in a way where we get the past and the pre uh, we get the, the present and the past and the past is in a kind of a what I really what are really prose poems, um, and they're quite beautiful. They go into all sorts of things. Um, the most interesting parts are probably the Great War and then the bullfighting. And the bullfighting we can see recurs in Sun Also Rises, and I have a, my own uh, bullfighting story um in fact in a second i forgot to get out the posters i have the posters and playbills from a bullfight that i saw in spain i which i witnessed the great matador javier vasquez and his triumph at the plaza the plaza de toros in madrid and that was um one of the most uh, uh unreal events i i have ever witnessed it was like you know you see these things like in movies and you read you know, it, it also looking back, it's interesting to reread these works because it makes me realize how much I absorbed from Hemingway um, and that later then played a part in my own life. I mean, even I won't say much, but even the fact that, you know, Hemingway himself and the woman that he loved that he expected to come and then that didn't happen, um, you know, from a foreign country, um, someone that he was in love with when he lived somewhere else. And that they had a life together and then that didn't happen. So, um, you know, uh, it's just interesting to look back and see how these things, you know, art influences life. Right. Um, but that, that bullfight was, uh, it was just unreal. I, it, it's, it, it's so beyond words. Um, I tried to write about it for a long time, but you know, Ezra Pound says that when you, when you experience a life-changing moment, you know, you should write just for practice, but don't expect it to be the finished product because it'll be terrible. And he's right. So it takes a long time to process it and find the words to describe the things that one goes through. Um, and that's, of course, how he came up with his poem uh, in a station in the Metro. He was in Paris, you know, with these expats, and he was one day walking to the Metro, and he just happened to witness something that was kind of an epiphany to him in terms of the beauty of the moment where we have this juxtaposition again between modernity and, and mechanized life versus the almost archetypal beauty of the people gathered and going about their day. And he wrote uh, an, an, you know, a lo an epic poem about it and then whittled it down to basically two lines in a station of the Metro, the apparition of these faces in the crowd petals on a wet black bow, which is just imagistic. So, um, the one thing that happened reading this is major synchro. So the first, the first part of the book, it says on the key at Smyrna, the strange thing was, he said how they screamed every night at midnight. I do not know why they screamed at all. At that time we were in the Harbor and they were on the pier and at midnight they started screaming. We used to turn the searchlight on them to quiet them. I, that it always did the trick. We'd run the searchlight up and down over them two or three times and they stopped it was one time i was a senior officer on the pier and a turkish officer came up to me in a frightful rage because one of our sailors had been most insulting to them he goes on to basically say that these these women are screaming um in turkey during the war because they're holding their um 
they're, let's say they're little loved ones and they're, they are um, not alive. Um, and then that plays a part in, of course, in a farewell to arms. But what happens with the synchro is on page 12 of the book, um, it says they were all out on the pier and it wasn't at all like an earthquake or that sort of thing because they never know about the Turk. Okay, so so this is synchro, synchro, y'all, because uh, one of our friends, one of our main homeboys here um, just experienced uh, the tremors of an earthquake up north. And um, and then, you know, the fellas were talking, you know, our homeboys were talking about how they'd experienced an earthquake at certain times. And then I was thinking about how in 2012, I remember the earthquake. This was interesting because there, it was the big earthquake. It was like 2012, I think. It was the big earthquake in VA that um, that caused the fissure in the Washington Monument. And, you know, it, it like ruptured all the foundations in Virginia all the way up to D.C. And I remember, and it was Jerry. <laughs> um, and I remember at the time, what happened was on the news, they said an earthquake 295 miles away from D.C. rocks the area. Well, instead of saying, you know, 20 miles outside Richmond. They just completely, they, they acted like none of us existed, right? And the earthquake was like 20 miles away from me. Um, and, but I felt it. And and then I was thinking at the time that um, I, I was in an earthquake. I was in an earthquake in another earthquake. Um, and our West Coast homeboys, uh, shouts out to OK. He's, he's probably been in like 322 earthquakes. Um, but when I was um, 13, I was in Greece and I was in Athens and um, I was standing at this place, the International Hotel in Athens, um, which is which sounds really fancy, but it was just a seedy, a terrible seedy hotel. Um, and uh, and I was there with my friends. We were on a, a trip and. Um, and I remember think I remember feeling the the, the hotel shaking. And I was like, dude, stop jumping on the bed. And I looked up and there was nobody jumping on any of the beds. And then we were like, oh, shit, it's an earthquake. It's got to be an earthquake. Um, and, and it was. And this particular earthquake, like, rocked Turkey. And it was this huge earthquake in Turkey, like, devastating. And I was thinking about that. And then right after I thought about that, I was reading the book here. And I got to the part about the Turkish earthquake which I had just been talking about. And then this occurs in the book. And then um, what was it yesterday? The news came on about the devastating um, earthquake in Turkey, right? Which is, which is very synchro. So my whole point of this is that, you know, it, I, I find this constantly in literature again, that you read and th that life and literature, you know, literature is living. It's, it's constant. It's like breathing. It's like, br it's like reading, breathing pages and they're living and your life. The reason people write books is because the things are truthful. And so they occur in the book. Right. And that's just crazy. It's, it's crazy to me. I don't mean that in a Jungian sense, uh, like literally, I, I mean that it, it is crazy. How, it's crazy. <laughs> it's crazy. Um, how these things constantly recur. And I've told you about how I'll be reading and this occurred in a farewell to arms. I was, there was one part where I was reading, I was reading something. I was listening to music. It occurred with Kings of convenience in one of those other streams, but I was reading something and it was an unusual word. It was like, it was like the word vermilion. Right. And all of a sudden that's not the word, but it was like that. And then all of a sudden I was listening to some song and then I heard that word. Now, now that I've said vermilion, I'm going to see the word vermilion somewhere and not just by reading Gerard Manley Hopkins, where, which is where I learned the word vermilion. But I'll see that somewhere or it'll be in a book, right? Or you will. Um, so so um, chapter one, the chapter one vignette says, everybody was drunk, the whole battery was drunk, going along the road in the dark. We were going to the, to the champagne. The lieutenant kept riding his horse out into the fields and saying to him, I'm drunk. I tell you, mon vieux, I'm so soused. We went along the road all night in the dark and the adjutant kept riding up alongside my kitchen and saying, you must put it out. It is dangerous. It will be observed. We were 50 kilometers from the front, but the adjutant worried about the fire in my kitchen. It was funny going along that road. That was when I was a kitchen corporal. And then we get this interesting story about 
um, the Indian camp. And what happens here is Nick Adams um, is with his dad and he's trying to show him how to be a doctor. Um, and they come across a camp of Native Americans and there's a woman there and she's with child. And so his dad has to deliver the child. So we get birth at the beginning and then we get death at the end. But he, his first introduction is like, or our introduction to Nick Adams is that the woman is with child and he says, go and get some hot. Well, they always get hot water, right? Go and get the water hot and get some towels. And then they say, um, the baby is, the baby is um, not facing the correct direction. Nick did not watch. And then the dad says, go on and um, get me a jackknife. And then he, it says, he was feeling exalted, the dad afterwards, and talkative as football players are in the dressing room after a game. That's one for the medical journal, George, he said, doing a cesarean with a jackknife and sewing it up with a nine-foot tapered gut leaders. Oh, you're a great man, all right, he said. Ought to have a look at the proud father. They're usually the worst sufferers in this little affair. The Indian lay with his face toward the wall. His throat had been cut from ear to ear. Blood had flowed down into a pool where his body sagged the bunk. His head rested on his left arm. The open razor lay edge up to his, um, to, in his blankets. The ladies always have such a hard time having babies, Nick asked. No, that was very, very exceptional. Why did he, um, why did he keel himself, Daddy? I don't know, Nick. He couldn't stand things, I guess. Do many men do that, Daddy? Not very many men, Nick. Do many women? Many men. Many, many, many men. Wish death upon me. Oh, I don't cry no more. Don't look to the sky. No, remember, she shouts out a Fitty Scrant out there. To many women, hardly ever. Don't they ever? Oh, yes, they do sometimes. Daddy, yes. Where did Uncle George go? He'll turn up all right. Is dying hard, Daddy? No, I think it's pretty easy, Nick. It all depends. They were seated in the boat, Nick in the stern, his father rowing. The sun was coming up over the hills. A bass jumped, making a circle in the water. Nick trailed his hand in the water. It felt warm in the sharp chill of the morning. In the early morning in the lake, sitting in the stern of the boat with his father rowing, he felt quite sure that he would never die. Bam, right? Um, so he is, um, he is at the... Uh, He's at the turning point in life, right? He's going through his rite of passage. And his rite of passage is mirrored in the passage of the child that they've just delivered. The child is not delivered. The child is from his mother's womb untimely ripped. And he is ripped into life. And, of course, he now experiences life and death almost simultaneously. The father of the child is watching the child be born, but he thinks that it's not going to end well. And he ends himself. And then for Nick, he survives that and rows off into the sunrise with his father. So at least they have the hope of the sunrise, right? The morning star is rising. They're rising there. Um, they're going off into the, the echoes of life. And yet Nick has, has been through this. He's experienced this. Chapter two says, um, is again, chapter two is the sort of prose poem the prose poems that interrupt the narratives or the vignettes rather minarets stuck up in the rain out of Adrianople across the mud flats. The carts were jammed for 30 miles along the uh, Karagach road, water, Buffalo and cattle were hauling carts through the mud, no end and no beginning. So again, the road is the road of life for him, but there's no beginning and no end. It's just the present moment. Dust carts loaded with everything they owned. The old men and women soaked through, walked along keeping the cattle moving. Carts were jammed solid on the bridge with camels bobbing along through them. Greek cavalry herded along the procession. Women and kids were in the carts, crouched with, with mattresses, mirrors, sewing machines, and bundles. There was a woman having a kid with a young girl holding a blanket over her and crying, scared sick looking at it. It rained all through the evacuation. Now, I think, because this image also occurs in Farewell to Arms, we get the procession of the people evacuating the war. And what we have here is this particular image of the sewing machine, right? And the sewing machine is interesting because that ties up with him sewing up the woman just a minute ago um, in, the, in, in a different locus and in a different, you know, it's completely different. But that's supposed to tie into his vision of life. And 
the sewing machine also is a, it's such a particular image that I can't help but think, and it's not really important, but I can't help but think that Hemingway must have observed this in his real life, that it's so stark. It's like you see these people and they're evacuating and they've got all this stuff, kind of like in um, in The Empire of the Sun, right? All the people are are evacuating from the Japanese invasion and they've got these carts and the carts are loaded almost like Blood Meridian style. The carts are loaded with like all of their their objects and like they've got mirrors and chandeliers and stuff. So it almost becomes this like weird, this, this weird, um, uh, procession of like, you know, it's like a medieval puppet play or like, it's, it's like in, um, it's like in Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead, which we covered in one of our other streams, um, as part of it where like the, the traveling troop of actors, they can, they have everything with them in the caravan. But here it's different because these people are all at a loss and they're on this road with no beginning and no end. They seem like they're exposed. And um, also, um, let's see, also there's, of course, there's, my note says, there's childbirth again in the midst of the procession, um, integrating of birth and death in war, which is what I mentioned as part of my thesis statement for this, right? Bur uh, l love, and war, love and death in the midst of war. Um, maybe, yes, it, Thomas Anderson says, maybe he saw something like this in Spain. Um, think of what he, I mean, think of witnessing like, the, you, you see the Spanish Civil War, you see the D-Day invasion, you, you're in Italy in World War I. Um, it's a, that's a lot. And of course, he's a correspondent, you know, he's a journalist or whatever, but he's not really a journalist. I mean, he's, he's writing articles or whatever so he can go there, but it's all... But it's all material for his novel, which is different than, you know, when you see uh, Canderson Uper with the green screen in Iraq. You know, maybe it's the same in terms of maybe it is the same. Maybe it's just a different version of that. But regardless, um, like Whitman says, he was there. Um, and so, you know, I, I just can't. It's hard to imagine these things. That's why we have his writing, I suppose. Um in the next scene, and then in one of the one of the other vignettes, we get that his um his dad gets in a fight with somebody. Um, and he he sees his dad fight. Uh, chapter four, the chapter four prose poem. It was a frightfully hot day. We jammed an absolutely perfect barricade across the bridge. It was simply priceless. A big old wrought iron gutting from the front of a house too heavy to lift and you could shoot through it and they would have to climb over it it was absolutely topping they tried to get over it and we potted them for 40 yards they rushed it and officers came out along and worked on it it was an absolutely perfect obstacle their officers were very fine we were frightfully put out when we heard the flank had gone and we had to fall back and this is interesting because again this is just the this is almost rambodian this is like in illuminations um when he talks about the brooklyn bridge or in in uh, the drunken boat, and it's just like it's the image of what we see there in the moment, and the symbolism is heavy, but obviously because we get the characters here who it, this is truthful. They are concentrated on what they are doing, and they take such pride in being able to build this obstacle, and that's life. And then the the irony is that the obstacle, of course, is the obstacle to life, and that they're going to live, and the guys coming over it are going to die. So war, again, is this kind of crucible crucible of life events. Um, one of the other stories uh, is... Um, yeah, I've got to find which one it is. Um, I'm not going to look for it. I'm just going to paraphrase it. So what happens in one of the other stories is that like he's a kid and his dad, um, like there it's dealing with horses and his dad, um, basically we figure out that they're fixing the horses. And so there's this beautiful horse. And then at the end of the race, one of the jocks was like, yeah, he was a great horse. He had to work so hard to not let the horse win. So they're holding back. They're holding back life and motion and it's all fixed. And then his dad goes for a ride on the horse. The horse bucks, his dad dies. And then somebody goes over and shoots the horse. And then right after that, he hears these, these adults talking and the guys are like, yeah, he had it coming to him. So, so in one moment, right in like the span of just a few minutes, 
His dad dies. That's tied up with the horse now being killed and then learning this thing about his dad. And he doesn't, and he sits there and he cries and they're like, don't listen to what they said about your dad. He was a fine fella. And it's like, but he can't ever forget that. Um, we, uh, let's see, chapter 15. Um, they hanged Sam Cardinella at six o'clock in the morning in the corridor of the county jail. The corridor was high and narrow with tiers of cells on either side. All the cells were occupied. The men had been brought in for the hanging. Five men sentenced to the to be hanged were in the five top cells. Three of the men to be hanged. Uh, okay, they were frightened. One of the guys sat on his cot with his head in his hands. The other lay flat on his cot with a blanket wrapped around his head. They came out onto the gallows through a door in the wall. There were seven of them, including two priests. They were carrying Sam. He had been like that since about four o'clock in the morning. While they were stop, strapping his legs together, two guards held him up and two priests were whispering to him, be a man, my son. Um, and when they came toward him with the cap to go over his head, he lost control of himself. Um, and they, are, they were disgusted. Then they put him in a chair and they hang him and the priest stepped back off the scaffolding just before the drop fell. And then we get the Big Two-Hearted River. And the Big Two-Hearted River and Big Two-Hearted River Part 2 talk about basically how the landscape is broken and burned out. And this guy, he's just, he's fishing. And that's interesting because the way that he, um, when he's fishing, he says, like, you got to touch the water before you reach in and grab the fish because if you, because there's a mucus that will cover where you touch it if, you, if your hand isn't wet first. And then that's why there are all these dead fish lying all over the river. And that is mirrored in the way that his, when he reaches into the water, into the stream, it's mirrored in the way that his dad um, helps to, helps the woman to give birth. And it's also mirrored in the way that in Farewell to Arms, Henry falls into the river um, or jumps into the river to escape. And then this sort of gives him light. He could live or die. He could be shot in the water right when he first dives in, or he could live. And he ends up living and he goes again, he goes through this kind of baptismal imagery of changing his, 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 his worldview is, um, to, is kind of cauterized after he, which is ironic, right? Um, after he gets out of the river because he's gone through a, a baptism of fire and a, another sort of baptismal imagery in the water coming out and going on to the other side. He crosses the other side. The water is also the abyss, of course. Um, but the scene that's the, that is really one of my favorites is when he talks about, um, the bullfight and, uh, the one where it has the rigged, um, the rigged horse, which also has echoes of kind of, you can see Hunter S. Thompson and his fear and loathing in, at the Kentucky Derby as sort of taking uh, its cue from this in a little way. Um, it's called My Old Man in chapter 13. And one of the vignettes, of course, is about uh, one of the bulls, boars, uh, the matador. Another one is about how the matador is the bull shows courage and is elegant and the matador is sloppy and basically executes the bull sloppily and like without any honor. And then they all throw stuff down at him. And then his response is, I'm not a very good matador because he sees him at the bar later. Um, chapter 12. This is very fit. This is really fit. I'll kind of end with this. This is really famous Hemingway. Um, it happened right down close in front of you. You could see Villalta snarl at the bull and curse him. And when the bull charged, he swung back firmly like an oak when the wind hits it, his legs tight together. The muleta trailing and the sword following the curve behind. Then he cursed the bull, flopped the muleta at him and swung back from the charge, his feet firm, the muleta curving and at each swing, the crowd roaring. When he started to kill, it was all in the same rush. The bull looking at him straight in front hating. He drew out the sword from the folds of the muleta and sighted with the same movement and called to the bull, Toro, Toro, and the bull charged and Vilalta charged and just for a moment they became one. 
Velalta became one with the bull, and then it was over. Velalta standing straight in the red hilt of the sword, sticking out dully between the bull's shoulders. Velalta, his hand up at the crowd, and the bull roaring blood, looking straight at Velalta and his legs waving. Now, that is a br uh, brilliant passage and play-by-play -play of the bullfight itself because, and I, I personally think this is brilliant because that was clearly in my mind when I saw um, the bullfight with Javier Var Vasquez in uh, Madrid because the, the what the bullfight is supposed to be in terms of its aesthetic and its kind of ritual is that the mat it's a dance it's a da it's a dance macabre it's a dance of death and that they are supposed to be kind of equal adversaries in this ring and say what you will about the bullfight you know all that stuff but but at the moment of triumph it's either the matador gets bold i mean gets gored by the bull or they be they or he he kills the bull, but in an in an in an elegant way where it's it's just him and the bull, and they're at a match, and it's all in one fluid motion. It's almost like lightning fast, like you can't even see it, but it's it's flourishing, and it's like this this weird, um, this weird death dance, right? It's an I mean, it's an ancient, it's like an ancient ritual, a a, a Greco Roman ritual that you're seeing in real time in real life. It's it's. It, I mean, it's it's like astounding. It's stunning. You can't believe that you're there for this. Um, and you know, it's hard. It's it's pretty hard to process. Um, and so, uh, anyway, I've got I've got um, posters. Should I go look for them? Thanks, just thanks y'all for being here. I'm gonna I'll be right back. I'm gonna get them from this closet right here. Hold on a second. So I've got a, I've got a, uh, a, a tall one um, that I'm not going to be able to find. Um, but this is one of the bills from when I was there um, in Spain. And this is one of the ones that I witnessed. This is, oh, it's March uh, 30th, 2003. This is an actual bill from the wall that I found. I don't know. It's just interesting. Um, and then this is one of the other ones that I found when I was there. This is a bullfighting bill. Um, and there he is, uh, just the matador. And then, um, this is the, my favorite one. Cause this is Javier Vasquez. This is April 6, 2003. Javier Vasquez. And there he is with the bull. So anyway, those are. Authentic uh, playbills, I guess, I suppose, um, from uh, from Spain. So Spain is a Spain is a so amazing and mind blowing. It's one of my favorite places I've ever been. I spent about three weeks or a month in Spain in 2003. Uh, I was there. I was in Sevilla for uh, Santa de Semana. Uh, I went. I was in Almeria, Barcelona, Madrid. Um, a bunch of bunch of places in Spain. Um, and it was it was beautiful. Um, so I should have this framed, especially this Javier, especially this Javier Vasquez one. I've got another one that's like really large, really tall, really large. Um, but this is my favorite one because I mean this it really was brilliant. Um, he was exactly I, I imagined perfectly what Hemingway was seeing. Um, when he saw the bullfight in Spain. And I've got a picture of Hemingway 
at the bullfight. I don't know if I loaded it on here, so I might not be able to find it. Um, but he was, of course, a bullfighting aficionado and saw this as kind of the 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 epic culmination of man versus beast, of course. Um, and anyway, say what you will about all that stuff, um, but that that was what the event was. I know there's a, a lot of things people say about that, but that's... I, it's neither really neither here nor there. I'm just talking about the event itself and what I witnessed. So anyway, that's about all I got, you guys. Um, let's see if I got any super chat, super chats. Um, shouts out again to um I missed Amy's super chat last time she super chatted after the stream was over last time. Um, I think, or maybe it just came in late. So shouts out to Amy for that super chat. Really appreciate you. Um, and then that was a great stream. I thought with, um, doing Ender's game with our homeboy, Andy, um, with, uh, talking about Ender's game. So that was cool. And then let's see if we got any, I didn't get any super chat, super chats, but let's see. Um, here's another super chat from, oh, there's five bucks from our homegirl, Amy. Thank you so much, Amy. You're, you're the best. Really appreciate all your support. It means so much to me. Um, Yo, shouts out to shouts out to our homeboy Mo Chief, who sends twenty dollars uh, via PayPal. Really appreciate you. Thank you so much. Y'all support really means a lot. So again, yes, thank you to um, uh, Jonathan, Stephen, uh, Mo Chief, and Amy, and 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 uh, Jason. Thank you, to, and Jason. Thank you so much for those super chats. Really appreciate y'all. You can support me anytime. Um, really, really appreciate the the support. I mean, it means so much to me, you know? I mean, again, this is February, kind of dark times, dark winter here. So um, not the dark winter, um, but uh, really appreciate your support. And I need that for uh, Red Bull McD's to eat. I lost 10 pounds last week. Um, so, uh, you know, that's a good thing though. Um, but yeah, still lost 10 pounds. So I really appreciate your, your support. Um, and thank you to, um, thank you to, oh yeah. Thank you to Genghis who sends in, um, 10 bucks. Really appreciate your homeboy. Thank you for that super chat. Genghis, you, you always, um, support your big supporter. Really appreciate you again. I'll be coming back soon with the, um, Norm Macdonald stream. We're going to be talking about Norm Macdonald and his, I'm um, not a memoir doing tons of Norm talk. I'll be back next week, um, probably Wednesday, Wednesday or so, with our homeboy Chase Haggard. So we'll be talking about Whiplash, Black Swan, and Birdman. Put some respect on my name again. Birdman, the film with um, Michael Keaton doing the Tortured Artist stream. I'll be doing, uh, I've got a bunch of sponsor streams, and I'm, I'm going to try to get the um, Wes Anderson um, film analysis in, I guess, probably this weekend. Shouts out to all of our homeboys out there, our friends and family. And uh, shouts out to my sister. I love you. Um, and y'all pray for me. Pray for all of our friends. And um, lots of stuff coming up. Shouts out. Big shouts out to our homeboy Jerry out there who's been here and um, who is killing it. And shouts out to Kristen, Slowboy Whiteboard. Always love seeing you. Shouts out to beautiful Claire out there. And uh, big, big shouts out to our homeboy Jethro, who is... Uh, my very good friend and our friend and who keeps it all rolling here. Okay. He's a Kang. So <laughs> shouts out to our friend. Okay. That's about all I got y'all. I love y'all. Um, thank you for being here for this Hemingway stream. I hope that was, um, you got something from it. Leave some comments afterwards or whatever you think. Um, you know, give, give us, give us some insight, smash the like, share the stream. And that's about all I got. Thanks y'all. Peace. Love y'all. Peace.